everyone. Well, welcome to, I guess, a special edition of the Stanford Algebra Geometry Seminar. Uh, so this summer, there'll be three bonus talks that are going to be, uh, I guess, somewhat more expository, although they get to really interesting stuff, but they're also intended to uh, introduce uh, uh, algebra geometers to nearby things that are useful too. But, uh, but I have the usual few announcements before starting. Uh, please mute yourself unless you have something you wish to say. I apologize for the echo here because uh, the attempted hybrid talk, as usual, did not work. And so hopefully Hunter will not be echoing, but I will since I want to hear in case people have questions or things to say. Uh, if you're willing to put your video on, just because it's nice to see each other, eating on screen is allowed and even encouraged so people can feel comfortable doing that. Uh, there's also more of a parallel chat in Discord. I didn't set one up because the Algebraic Geometry Syndicate Discord also might be a natural home for it. So instead, just we can use Zoom chat if you feel like it. Uh, uh, but use it only if you feel like it. Some find it distracting, others find that it helps you concentrate. So speak your name while in chat, but I will so I can relay. Please questions. relay questions. Yes, I will relay questions. And if you yell out questions, I don't know whether you I won't be able to hear it, but if, will, if you yell, I will yell about yeah. so, uh, <laughs> I'll be able to hear you. So, so I will pass out questions. So just go ahead and just yell them out. Uh, not too loud or my ears will explode. Uh, and stop them out ahead of you. People have to lots of questions, including quite elementary ones. So please do so. Uh, and the seminar is small enough that if, uh, if you have a question, you shouldn't raise your hand. Just unmute yourself and ask it out loud. Uh, and if you see a discussion, the question you think should be asked, just unmute yourself and ask it out loud too. Okay, so we're very happy to have um, have Hunter Spink here from down the hall. Uh, uh, he's going to tell us about urban Uh Great. Well, thanks for the invitation. Um, so today I want to uh, tell everyone about what omen is. is. Um, I'm sure a lot of the people here have seen the word omen and seen you can prove great theorems with it, then opened the Wikipedia page and saw it involved like logic or something like that, and then gave up immediately which is why I did like five or six times. Um, but today I'm going to make it super down to earth, no scary model theory, no symbols, and actually is a really practical theory that you can just use just like right out of the box to prove things. Um, and basically as a practitioner of someone who uses minimality on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, I just don't know any model theory at all. So you can just like actually use it to prove like actual theorems without worrying about any of the implementation details. Uh, but you have to do it this way. So I'm gonna tell you how to do it. Don't look on Wikipedia, it's horrible. All right, <clears throat> so uh, let me um, go to here. So what is omen amount? So let's recall what algebraic geometry is first. So algebraic geometry is the study of sets that you can write down using plus and times and like whatever constants from your field and like variables and stuff. <laughs> so if you combine these uh, operations with uh, constants and variables, you get polynomials. And then you can like make varieties and you know constructible sets if you like add and remove varieties from each other. And those are basically all the relevant sets that you ever see in algebraic geometry, probably by like Chevrolet's theorem. Um, so the reason algebraic geometry is good is because plus and times are associated to fields and fields are the best. Everything is great about fields. Everyone say fields for like a million years and we have all the best theorems about them. That's why people do it. Usually we do it over an algebraic closed field because that is an even better theory. So that's algebraic geometry for you. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, uh, well, what if I look at sets defined using not only polynomials, which are, you know, some things are polynomials. And if your set is a polynomial, please just use your own theorems. But if you happen to also want to use x for sine or cosine or just like any calculator function that you happen to know and that would help you in uh, answering a question, maybe you would consider O minimal geometry. Um, so the idea is that uh, this collection of functions where dot, 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 I'll describe a little bit later what the dot, dot, dot can consist of. But basically, model theorists accidentally stumbled upon the greatest uh, condition ever to say that a set of functions can't do anything bad when you try and create the analog of an algebraic variety. So just like an algebraic variety, you write down a bunch of equations and you're like, oh, look at this variety. Varieties are really nice. They have a lot of like structural properties. They're like manifolds locally outside the singularity set. And you know, you can, you can do a bunch of nice geometry with them. 
Similarly here, you can do a lot of differential geometry with these things. And basically you can never create a bad set. So you literally but, cannot before, write a bad manifold down. This is the working definition of O-minimality, but I'll tell you the actual definition of O-minimality, where bad means, for example, like a Cantor set, or from a model theorist perspective, an infinite discrete set is bad, although for a normal mathematician, you might not see why. Um, also, anything you write down is gonna be piecewise differentiable. Um, you're always gonna have finitely many connected components, just like a bunch of nice, you know, generic things that is just like, it, it's, it's great that you can never escape the realm of reasonable manifolds or reasonable unions of manifolds by using these functions. Um, but there are some like extremely powerful theorems besides the fact that you never leave this like nice class of like manifolds or like finite unions of manifolds. And uh, that's ultimately what I'm going to be talking about. <clears throat> so uh, the theorems that I'm going to get to, so I'm going to prove two theorems that were in the abstract of the talk and we'll get to them, but the uh, omen so, ability uh, is- quick, yes. so, uh, so quick question. So mm -hmm. uh, Jesse asks, uh, Jesse Cass asks, with omen geometry, am I supposed to think of the constants as real numbers. And before you answer that, I want to add in my own as well, which is when I see this, I think, well, great, we can just work complex analytically. And I like those. And you just happen to be taking the real points. And of course, they behave nicely. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the answer is, um, formally, the theory is set up over the real numbers. However, the best applications of it use a blend of the, the, the real theory of own minimality with the fact that the thing under consideration has a complex analytic structure. So over the past decade, people like mix those two together to prove some powerful things. And that's gonna be the second thing that I talked about today. Crucially uses both the compound fact that it's a complex surface, a complex curve, and that it has this O minimal structure in the real sense. And that interplay is ultimately what ended up proving the Andre word conjecture. So uh, as I was saying, O minimality, um, the theorems I'm gonna say are going to be about finiteness statements. So O-minimality is kind of ideally geared towards this. So algebraic geometry, uh, we have very powerful tools for getting exact numbers of points of intersection up to multiplicity. Like intersection theory is set up to give us exact numbers. And we have this whole theory that when you deform things, the numbers can't change. In O-minimality, you lose the ability to exactly count the number of solutions to something but you always get that things are finite. There's always a finiteness in its core, like a finite number of connected components or a finite amount of, um, uh, a finite number of solutions. We're gonna see how this you know, comes to fruition to prove some very interesting things. But the questions we're gonna ask, you wouldn't even want to, I mean, there are tools for getting some estimates, but basically we're going to ignore getting precise answers, but we're going to gain the ability to use more functions and to get finiteness theorems even in algebraic geometric setting. So the theorems I'm gonna say are theorems of algebraic geometry, but algebraic geometry just can't prove them. It's just too weak for a very specific reason. So a uh, historical question is, yeah. omen, this is from Ashwin G, is uh, omen morality inspired by growth and decay tame topology? Are they yes, yes. So growth and decay at one point, well, I don't know whether the model theorists knew what they were doing, but the, ultimately it came, uh, growth and decay was the first person to say, why can't I use X and sine and cosine? This is stupid. And then the O-minimal geometers over a period of like 10 or 15 years developed this theory. And then it was with Hovansky in the first application I'm going to show you today, who first applied the theory to prove something interesting. So basically there's a big period where just a big theory was developed and there were no applications. And then there were some applications. And then the last decade, there were like a, a million applications. And now it's like the hottest new thing to use is O-minimality. Um, all right, but I wanna, okay, so uh, so right now I wanna talk about definable sets. So I, I said like I said is definable. Let me uh, make it precise what this means. So the setup of a definable set is we're gonna have a collection of functions, uh, plus and times and uh, some other functions. Um, I'm not gonna say what the niceness condition on this collection of functions is. I'm just saying if I have a collection of functions, the definable sets associated to it are this. And when I impose O minimality, these definable sets will be nice, but in general, they'll just be some garbage sets according to this definition. So a subset is definable if for some formula, your set is the set of points where the formula is true. So what we should be thinking of is for example, a circle is definable because it's the set of points where X squared plus Y squared equals one is true. 
the formula x squared plus y squared equals one induces the definable set being the circle. So being the property being definable just means there's some formula that cuts it out. Where this formula, obviously I have to have some stipulations on it and it has to involve this curly F here. So uh, first of all, I'm gonna allow you real constants and parentheses and variables. So, so for, example, for example, here's some, some real constants, constants and parentheses and, parentheses and uh, variables on the, on the right side. Um, not, um, very not very interesting, interesting. Not, not even a formula form, really, not, not even well formed, form. just like a, just terrible. Um, so I better allow you to use some functions to combine all these variables with parentheses and stuff to make interesting things. So for example, if I have an F1 and an F2 and F1 is binary and F2 is unary, I can make this expression. Notice how I'm allowed to compose F1 with F2. And this is actually a subtle point. With polynomials, you don't actually get extra strength by considering composition because a composition of polynomials is a polynomial. However, with this scenario, you can imagine I can define really complicated things like X of X of X of sine of cosine of X of sine of whatever. I mean, there's no restriction at all on how I compose these things. It just has to be well-formed. But this isn't a formula that's true or false, it's just a function. So we need predicates. And the predicates that we take are inequalities and equalities. So greater than, equal, or less than. So now I can make a statement, assuming I've chosen some concrete F1, F2, and F3, that's either true or false. So this, because, it's a, uh, because there are two free variables, is going to define a subset of R to the two, and it's gonna define the subset where this you know, thing is true. <clears throat> Now, I don't want to really restrict you in any way on what kind of sets you can define. So if you have a bunch of these statements, you can combine them together with knots and ands and ors and implies and by implies, just any logical connective one. And what this does to the definable sets is it basically allows you to take Boolean combinations of your definable sets. So you're free to do that. So I can create an even more complicated thing if I had an F4 and an F5. So this, you know, so really complicated thing. But I'm going to allow you a little bit more power, and we're going to see why I want to allow you even more power in defining a formula, which is I'm going to allow you to quantify over the real numbers. I'm going to allow you existential quantification and universal quantification. And so, for example, you can write down a formula like this. Notice that I have an auxiliary variable z, which is bound by the existential quantifier. So this is still a formula of x1 and x2 being free variables, and it defines a subset of r to the two, but I have this additional variable that can be bound and it can you know, influence the formula. So actually you can create very complicated formulas using huge number of variables that define a subset of r to the two. As long as I only have two free variables, I can have as many bound variables as I want. And using this, uh, this allows you to access calculus one to three definitions of like continuity and differentiability. Because if you want to talk, if you want to like say the sentence, like blah is continuous, you probably would unwind that in your head as for all upside, for all delta and R, there exists an epsilon and R such that yada, 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 yada happens. So because you can phrase these calculus one concepts using the, these quantifications, continuity and differentiability, um, ultimately they can be embedded in the formulas and we can actually talk about where something is continuous or differentiable in our definitions. And that's actually quite a useful feature. But you can also do, I'll show you on the next slide there, the power that this has is larger than you might even think to be able to use these things. Right, so examples of definable sets. So I'm going to take a concrete example. Here is my F, I have plus, I have times and I have X. And I'm going to write down a bunch of sets and say how they're defined. It's going to be really basic. So the first one is this subset of R to the two. So it's the set of X and Y such that Y is this function. Now, how do I express it as a definable set? I use this formula. In fact, set builder notation exactly allows me to take any formula I want and create the definable set in that way. It's you know, not very interesting. This is just like a corollary of what I was saying before. Let me say a more interesting one. Well, okay, this one's not too interesting. E to the X plus E to the Y is less than or equal to four. Notice on the previous slide, I allowed you less than and I allowed you equals, but I did not allow you less than or equals. 
Now, how am I going to get around this problem of defining something which is less than or equal? Well, luckily I allowed you or. So we can write down this formula, which says that you're either equal to four or less than four. And then that allows us to access less than or equals. And now I can freely use less than or equals now that I know this trick. Ultimately with these definable sets, I don't care what formula actually defines them. I just care that there is some formula that defines it. So now I have in my head, ah, I can now use less than or equal to and greater than or equal to, because I'm smart. I don't have to unwind everything like a computer or like one of those like proof assistants. All right, here's an interesting one. We're gonna look at the image of a function restricted to this curve y plus e to the z equals four. So this is a, uh, you know, it's not at all obvious how you would define this, but if we think about what the image of a function is, so it's probably going to be like the set of x, which you can express as e to the yz for some y and z satisfying that constraint. So having that existential, so I just took that thing that I said and I put it in words. There's, uh, there exists some y and z in R so that this free variable x is e to the yz and y and z are bound by this constraint. So you can express images of functions now. And in fact, if you, so ultimately that I can express image, but really I can be expressing any concept which doesn't involve like quantification over subsets of something. It's like, there's like this, there's this idea that these are first order statements and basically you can always unwind arbitrarily complicated statements down to these things. And as long as they don't involve talking about for all subsets of blah, something happens, you can generally unwind it. And here, because I only used exponentials, you would expect that the final formula would also only involve exponentials, so it would be safe. Right, so now the next formula. Here I have a log. Logs are not something I'm allowed to use actually. How do I access a log? Because you know it'd be nice if I could talk about log, but here I'm only allowed to talk about x. Well. Fortunately for us, log is implicitly defined in terms of x. Log, uh, log x is defined by the expression e to the z equals x. So what I can do is I can use an existential quantifier over an auxiliary variable z and have the first part of the statement bound z to be log x. And then the second part is me plugging in z equals log x into the formula. So now I can access log x. And I cannot just access log x. I can actually access any implicitly defined function of these things. So for example, I can access crazy things like Lambert's w function. And I can use it in expressions. And it's totally valid because I can always do this existential trick. So much more than just x and much more than just log is really a really shockingly large number of functions that we natively have at our disposal once we accept the fact that implicitly defined functions can always be defined using this existential trick. So in particular, we aren't conservative about the set of functions that we use. So, you know, when you're working with it, you know, X, oh, I meant to add plus and times into these sets, but basically this is just saying that if we also allow for log, there are no further definable sets. So we just like freely use it in our day-to-day -day life. And we just have to remember, oh, I know how to unwind. So let's now combine these things to try and define y equals 5x to the pi, which is going to be a very important example of a definable set. I mean, the pi is not important, the 5 is not important, but this example is important. So how do we define y equals 5x to the pi? So we definitely don't have powers in, this, um, in, this, uh, in, in our language. However, we do have x, and now we have log. So I can write x to the pi is e to the pi log x. And I know that I can unwind log as this existential statement. I'm not gonna do it because I don't have to, I just know I can. So if I was being very formal, I would do one more step where I unwind it like the previous one. And now we can define this thing where the exponent is allowed to be a real number. So you can, you have these functions as well. And this is going to be the cornerstone of the first main application of minimality that we get to is the idea that you can unwind the power function using just x or x bin log. The log is defined in terms of x. Okay, so now I have to tell you a niceness condition on functions 
since obviously if I just add in like Cantor functions, then I'm going to get garbage. So I'm going to map it. So, so, so this so, is sorry, the, Hunter. Can I? It is a bad definition. This is a bad definition, but it's the it is like the definition. I'll explain why it's bad. So, f a collection of functions is O minimal if every definable subset of the real line. So there's one free variable and arbitrarily many bound variables in your formula is a finite union of points and intervals where I don't put any restriction on what the endpoints of the intervals look like or whether they're bound. The key is the finite, so it can't be an infinite collection of intervals. I just chose pi randomly. You could just give yourself. Any but, but is it defined? How do you know what it is? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're allowed real constants. That was one of the things we're allowed. So I can just like grab it and any real constant I want to shove it into a formula. And then I do only more sets of them. I know it's degree. Maybe that ideals. Uh, degree, yes. Ideals, no. Generic points, yes, but I won't talk about it. Great. Okay, so okay, so this definition is like a really boring statement. It says subsets of the real line have some property, but like, why would you ever care about a subset of the real line being a finite union of like points and intervals? That seems like it's not going to lead me to anything interesting. In particular, you know, I promise this like great geometric theory where everything is this, you know, a union of manifolds. And this definition is talking about subsets of the real line. It doesn't mention continuity. It doesn't mention differentiability. It doesn't mention any of that. It just says, Subsets of the real line you define are nice. But let's see some of the con uh, constraints that it imposes, for example, on what functions we're allowed to add in. We aren't allowed to add in sine. Sine is bad. Sine is not O minimal. If I uh, use the formula sine of x equals zero, I can define an infinite set, an infinite discrete subset of the real line, which is pi z. So automatically, the definition right away restricts our ability to talk about periodic sets. Now we'll get in, you know, later on, I'm actually going to ironically show you that one of the main applications of omenimality is to periodic sets. So this is kind of contradictory there, but this says, so we can't add sine of X. We also can't add anything which might look nice, but then you use it in a formula in some crazy way. And then in this like hundred million character formula, you accidentally define something with oscillatory behavior. So if it's O minimal, periodicity can't spring up anywhere. It like nothing generated from your functions can create a periodic thing because then you have this problem. So how do you know you can add the exponential function? Great question. Uh, because someone proved it, that is, but we'll get to what functions you can add. Um, all right, so first of all, okay, I, now, now I want to say like, this is the very classical thing from like 1960 something, the tarski seidenberg theorem. Uh, says that this definition is not vacuous. So if I take the smallest possible f, I said that you always have to have plus and times, uh, this is O minimal. Uh, and it's O minimal by the Tarski Seidenberg theorem, which says that if I have some crazy formula with 100 million bound variables and one unbound variable, you can systematically eliminate all of those bound variables until you get a formula that has just one variable and no bound variables. So there are no existential things. And then it's almost, it's like completely trivial. It's like an undergraduate exercise to show that any system of polynomial equations and in equations with one variable is a finite union of points and intervals. That's not, that's, that's not, that's not hard. Um, so for example, it concretely, for example, implies that images of multivariate polynomial functions always give you a finite union of points and intervals. That's part of the Tarski-Seidenberg theorem. And in fact, it's formally equivalent. You can show that from this uh, image uh, property, that an image is always a finite collection of points and intervals, that uh, you can do this quantifier elimination. There's some like geometric connection between the structure of a formula and like the operation of image and projection. But I, I won't get into that. I'm just, here's an example of like where it's not obvious that it would be a finite union of points and intervals. Um, Wilkie's show, Alex Wilkie showed that this was O minimal if you add on X. So this is very surprising because as I showed in the previous slide, X can be used in really complicated formulas in really complicated ways, but this is O minimum. So for example, if I go to the previous slide, uh, this third example, I don't know what it is, but it's a finite union of points and intervals. I mean, you could figure out that it's a single interval, but ultimately that this is the implications. That third thing is a finite union of points and intervals. And I haven't said yet how O minimality, um, you know, restricts uh, definable sets in higher dimensions yet. 
but that's you know what we know so far. And now, okay, I said you can add on sine and cosine restricted to an interval. So formally, that means you take the function on that interval and define it to be some default value like zero or five outside of the interval. These are O minimal. Um, and I'll say actually what the largest class of O minimal things is. And basically it's because we avoided the infinite periodic thing that happens when you go to infinity. And the largest class of functions you can add in, if you're wondering, I mean, sure, these are the calculator functions. Really, you can add in uh, things called restricted analytic functions. So just take an analytic function, restrict it to a compact domain. Totally fine. You can throw all those in. And then you can also add on things called uh, uh, things solving what are called Fafian differential equations, which is roughly speaking a first order differential equation where the derivative of your function is, uh, is for example, y prime equals y is an example of a Fafian differential equation. It's a little bit more general where you're allowed the coefficients to also be functions from your existing set. So the, um, the Fafian closure is actually enormous and includes basically every single function that any mathematician has ever written down that they didn't try and explicitly make to be horrible. Um, I mean, I, I don't really know any reasonable examples outside of it. I mean, I do, but, you know, um, <laughs> Spencer. Question. Was... question. Um, why couldn't you include any sort of differential equation since uh, my understanding is that differentiability is definable? So that's a good question. So first of all, why double prime equals? Actually, your question wasn't just people who are able to use them here. Uh, so uh, the question was, why can't we use any differential equation? So uh, first of all, I want to say why uh, that would create a contradiction. Y double prime equals minus Y is solved by sine of X. So we definitely don't want any differential equation. And the differentiability is about, uh, it is like written into formulas involving your function. So the, the differentiability, uh, it, the being able to talk about differentiability isn't a statement about like, the functions I'm allowed to use as primitives, it's about like the further definable sets that I'm allowed. So once I have, for example, sine of X, I can talk about the set of points where like sine of X over cosine of X, I mean, sine of X restricted to zero to two pi over cosine of X restricted to zero to two pi is differentiable. So I can talk about the differentiability of things from my own minimal class, but it, the, being able to talk about differentiability doesn't allow me to decide whether something is allowed to be in my class or not. This, you know, this master theme is basically, we, you should just take that to be the O minimal things or this, because I mean, no one will ever <laughs> write down a function that's outside of this class. Um, all right, <clears throat> so first magic theorem of O minimal. So I give this definition and it restricted substance to the real line. And that was like, what? Um, here's the uniform boundedness theorem. So it's, I'm gonna say it in three parts. And uh, basically, I mean, I'm just like conglomerating a bunch of theorems with the last part having a fun twist. So uh, the last part's gonna be related to the uniformness up to that, it's just gonna be boundedness. So first of all, these O minimal things, the definable sets are finite Boolean combinations of connected differentiable manifolds. This boundary of some sort. Uh, yeah, well, the in, yes, uh, with, with some boundary of some sort, yeah. So, uh, the uh, so this means in particular that uh, you know you can't have um, yeah okay so 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 all all things in higher dimensional space are nice and differentiable even though the definition only talked about the real line very surprising and it's actually a really beautiful like twenty page proof where you systematically develop all of calculus from this ridiculous definition that every subset of the real line is a finite union of points and intervals um, next. Every one of these sets is homeomorphic to some subset of a simplicial complex. So it's like super nice. You can't actually create something with a bad topology. So you can't actually have sine of one over X for a topological reason that it just isn't homeomorphic to a union of relative interiors of simplices in a finite simplicial complex. So here, for example, if my uh, filled in triangle was my simplicial complex, the relatives interiors would be like the interior of the triangle and the interior of the sides and then the, the points and like all possible combinations of those are potentially um, de definable. But uh, yeah, so it's, it's homeomorphic to one of these, so no bad topology. But moreover, and this is where the twist is that makes that this is the magic of a minimum. So the first two things are already made. 
but the last thing is where the app where you use an application for a fixed number of symbols in your formula and this is the analog of degree so someone asks, like what's the analog of degree it's the number of symbols which kind of makes sense because the degree of an equation literally bounds the number of symbols you can use to write it down uh this for a fine for a, for a fixed number of symbols only a finite number of simplicial complexes can possibly occur in this definition so that's mind blowing yes sorry i just repeated what you said but i said it louder um <laughs> uh, yeah so only a finite number of simplicial complexes so genuinely the topology of the spaces you get where i use 20 symbols in my own minimal structure genuinely can't have more than like 300 trillion you know simplices or whatever I mean, there's some association that takes 20 to 300 million, but yeah, who knows what that is. Um, corollary. So the as a corollary of this first one, every definable function is piecewise differential. Why is this? Because the graph of a definable function, you know, encodes the function, and it's a piecewise, uh, you know, differentiable manifold. So in particular, these initial functions I added into my set were automatically restricted that I couldn't add in just like arbitrarily bad things. It actually had to have the differentiability built in when I added it in because of this corollary of O minimality. But now here's the corollary useful for applications. From this last statement that there are only a finite number of simplicial complexes that can occur, suppose your definable set is actually a finite union of points. Well, what are the possible simplicial complexes who are dimension zero is like one point or two points or three points or four points. Eventually, I'm going to, you know, I can't have infinitely many possible ones for a fixed number of symbols. So the number of points, assuming is finite in this, uh, in this uh, definable set, is bounded above by a function of the complexity. I guess more generally, the number of connected components is bounded above by a function of complexity if I don't want to impose this dimension zero hypothesis on it. But this is, uh, this is the corollary that's going to be important. And we will immediately apply it to prove an unbelievable theorem, Kovansky's funomial theorem. I don't know who has heard of Kovansky's funomial theorem, but uh, this is a very nice theorem that uh, as far as I can tell, very few people have heard of. So here's the theorem. Uh, yes, almost. Yes, because few people have heard of it. So I take my function. The support are all the indices of the non-zero coefficients. I should have just written out the definition, but this, the support is just the indices of the non-zero coefficients. Now, if I give you a system of equations like F1, F2, F3, da, 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 F, you know, N, and it has a finite number of solutions, Bayes-Zutz theorem gives you a bound on the number of solutions. Bayes-Zutz theorem says that the product of the degrees of the polynomials you use bound the number of solutions. In fact, it's the product of the degrees. Yeah, the product of the degrees bounds the number of solutions. But suppose <clears throat> I had very, very big exponents on these uh, functions. Bayes-Zutz theorem gets worse as the exponent increases. I claim there's a theorem that bounds the number of solutions independent of the size of the exponents. The number of real solutions, assuming it's finite, is bounded above by a function of the sizes of the supports. So there's a genuine upper bound that says, if I have a monomial and a trinomial and I count the number of simultaneous real solutions, there's an actual upper bound that doesn't depend on whether the exponents are like a thousand or a million or a billion. It genuinely is just finite, <clears throat> right? So the proof is going to be one line. But before the proof, I want to maybe uh, point out something. So we had this previous theorem that said this uh, application. So this last corollary is what I want to apply, that uh, the number of solutions is bounded above by the number of symbols. The problem is with polynomials, as the exponent increases, the number of symbols genuinely increases because an exponent is just shorthand for repeated multiplication. So if I have an exponent of 1,000, I actually use a thousand symbols. So I can't apply this theorem that bounds the number of solutions in terms of the number of symbols because the number of symbols keeps growing as the exponent grows. So I need a way of accessing the ex uh, uh, exponents without increasing the number of symbols. So we do it like this. The exponent we write using exponent log. And now 
it doesn't matter what the size of the exponent is. It doesn't even matter if the exponent is just an arbitrary real number. I didn't increase the number of symbols because constants always count as one in the symbol counting thing. So when you write it like this, it now only has a finite number of symbols. It has like a thousand times the sum of the support number of symbols. I, I, I don't really want to count it. I, I wrote down a formula and you know, whenever you write down a formula, you can just be like, ah, I didn't use too many symbols. How are you counting the number of symbols? Ah, so constants count as one, functions count as one. Yeah, uh, how do you count the number of symbols? Functions count as one, variables count as one, parentheses count as one. Uh, everything counts as one. Oh, so you're, you're counting the number of like printed symbols in the formula, not the number of symbols in your base defining them. Yeah, yeah, it's the number of symbols in the formula. Yes. Got it. Thank yeah. you. So it's, uh, but yeah, constants count as one under this convention. So it genuinely doesn't matter that in base 10, we have to write many zeros to write down a large, you know, number. Um, so yeah, so finite number of symbols, number of solutions is bounded above by a function of the number of symbols, and you're done. So is this how he first proved it? Or uh, no, he proved it by actually, well, he basically, so what happened was he proved the theorem uh, using uh, uh, some like incredibly clever ideas. He presented it at the ICM and then Vandendre said, you know what? You just repeated a bunch of proofs in this theory of O-minimality that we model theorists were studying for I don't know what reason. And then they came together and we're like, oh, look at that. We have this you know, amazing thing where X fits into so minimal thing. But he proved it uh, basically just, uh, just, just bare, bare hands. But that now with O-minimality, assuming you believe this O-minimal theorem, that it, it's a very nice black box. You, you just know X is O-minimal. And that's like a very easy thing to like memorize. It, it doesn't, there are no hypotheses on this really. It's like X is good. And then the proof is, oh, look, I just use X and I'm, yeah, done. So this is like a lot of theorems in O minimality. They just get crushed by the awesome power of the expressive power of the functions that you use. And the fact that we just know that these things are O minimal because now you might say, how did people prove these things were O minimal? Just really hard analysis. They just went right into these model theorists decided to learn a bunch of real analysis and they just really, really tried using real analysis and no model theory. And they proved, you know, these various collection of functions were open up, um, which, you know, shocking that that was, you know, uh, I, yeah, it's great. All right. <clears throat> so now I want to go on to the second application. So for the second application, I want to set it up by telling you an amazing fact and then giving you an amazing application. So here's the amazing fact. Uh, so this is the modern applications of omen in the past decade culminating in the proof of the Andre Ford conjecture are all based on this theorem called the Pilo Wilkie point counting theorem. So as a definition, a semi-algebraic set in R to the N is something defined by real polynomial equations and equations. Cool. So like a, a curve, like a parabola, or like a real surface. All right. Semi-algebraic sets can contain lots of rational points. Okay. So if I like count the number of rational points on the semi-algebraic set, counted by like height, for example, you know, if I order all rational numbers according to some, to some like total ordering, they can contain lots of rational points in some like logarithmic density sense. And we have a little frowny face there because that's not good. Um, surprisingly, transcendental sets do the exact opposite. They contain very few rational points. There's a little smiley face. All right, <clears throat> so here's the theorem. Take a subset of space and define the transcendental part to be the part of it that I don't know anything about how many rational points on it, because you know, number theorists have tried very hard to bound the number of rational points on you know, algebraic and semi-algebraic sets. And ultimately the bounds you get are you know, polynomial, but they're in, there's like, it's just, that's all number theory. Yeah, you get rid of all the number theory part of it. And then you end up with something that is the complete opposite of algebraic geometry. This is the most anti-algebraic geometric thing you could write down, uh, where I just remove all the algebraic things inside it. And the theorem, is that the number of rational points of height n or at most n on this transcendental piece grows slower than any polynomial in n. So it grows slower than n to the one half, it grows slower than n to the one third, it grows slower than n to the one quarter. And the only hypothesis is that your set is definable in this O minimal thing. So obviously if I was allowed to have my set be just an arbitrary curve that I'm like 
drawing, I could just like manually go through every single rational point. But the, somehow the own minimality is restricting the number of rational points on the transcendental part. And actually, this is the culmination of decades of work on interpolation polynomials. And this theorem actually only uses the fact that these own minimal sets are nice, so you can parametrize them locally with uh, kth order differentiable parametrizations where the kth order derivatives are all bounded. And that's really all you need. This is, this is a shocking theorem, and the own minimality is used as this like basic language where we can never create a situation where we leave uh, the ability to locally parametrize sets with uh, finite kth order derivatives. So it's like this unbelievably powerful theorem put into the perfect language for applications. You combine them, and then you never have to check this hypothesis ever because the O minimality takes care of all the niceness for you. Right, so here's the multiplicative Mann and Mumford theorem. <laughs> it's gonna have a similar flavor to the Kovansky theorem. Uh, take a polynomial and suppose it's not uh, some like stupid small polynomial that will obviously make this theorem false. Uh, the theorem is that there are finitely many solutions to f of x, y equals zero with x and y roots of unity. Now, although roots of unity are themselves algebraic for each individual n, there's no way to put them into an algebraic family. So just like with Kolbansky's theorem, even though x to the 1000 is an algebraic thing, it doesn't fit into an algebraic family you can apply a finiteness theorem to. So we want to somehow, in a similar way to Kolbansky's theorem, parametrize the roots of unity in a way that we can apply great theorems of O minimality like the one that I just set up. So as notation, let's define omega of z as e to the two pi i z. And the multiplicative Mann and Mumford theorem uh, by using omega of z is equivalent to saying that there are finitely many rational solutions in, the, in, this, uh, in this unit square to f of omega of s comma omega of t because a root of unity is really just e to the two pi i times some rational number. And this is periodic with the integral period. So I'm just bringing it down to zero to one so that I don't you know, count infinitely many solutions in a stupid way by just adding integers to it. And the key idea is that uh, we're gonna express the surface using these, uh, this O minimal class of functions. So how do we do it? So notice that when I apply omega to something, you get exponentials, cosines, and sines. So uh, the cosines and sines are gonna be bounded by this assumption that I'm going to impose that the real part of these S and T are between zero and one. So I'm actually gonna allow complex, I'm gonna consider the complex points as well, but I'm gonna bound the real part between zero and one because ultimately I'm interested in rational solutions between zero and one. But for now, this is gonna be some complex surface. This is like the original surface, but I pull it back under the exponential map, and then you would get some like infinitely periodic thing, and then I restrict to a fundamental domain. So it's basically the same as the surface topologically. And if you identified zero and one, I think it would like literally be exactly your surface uh, under like some polar coordinate transformation. Um, right, so it's both a complex surface or a complex curve, and it's a subset of R to the four that is uh, definable. Uh, I forgot to add plus and times into that set. <clears throat> and we want to show that there's finitely many solutions in uh, Q plus zero IQ. So under the identification of C of the two with R of the four, we want to know that there are finitely many rational solutions with zero complex one. Um, so here's a fact. S is equal to its own transcendental part. Morally, this is kind of obvious because once I plug in omega of S and omega of T into this polynomial expression, now we get some horrendous equation involving sines and cosines and exps. So there should be like no good reason you would find an algebraic thing inside this like manifestly horrendous, you know, equation, which involves all these things that have nothing to do with polynomials. Um, so I'll, I'll sketch the proof of this. So here's, here's the basic sketch. So suppose you contain, for example, a piece of a parabola. This like random surface that I wrote down is a complex surface. Suppose it contains a piece of a parabola. Well, if it contains a piece of a parabola, this complex analytic thing contains this real analytic piece of a complex parabola, this y equals x squared, just like a single little curve. 
by, um, by the fact that complex analytic thing contains a real analytic thing, it also contains the complexification. So it's also going to contain, in addition to this like little arc, it's also going to contain a little piece of y equals x squared, the complex y equals x squared. And then by complex analytic continuation, this is going to spread out and it's actually going to keep containing y equals x squared all the way to the end. So actually, S, this, two this real two-dimensional thing, contains this real two-dimensional, uh, you know, in, this, the, in the example I was saying, the, the parabola. So it would have to actually equal the parabola. So it would actually have to be algebraic. And now basically using a number of techniques like differentiating the variables or something, you can basically show outside of the most trivial situations, this is not a polynomial expression. The reason is because we actually are using like exponentials and cosines and sines in a meaningful way. And in like the most degenerate case, something silly happens where it's equivalent to some trivial thing. <clears throat> so this is, uh, this, is, this is what happens. Now we're going to conclude. So we want to show this surface has finitely many rational points. Well, points in here. Because it's equal to its transcendent part, it doesn't have many points of height at most r. Now for this next part, I'm gonna take actual numbers because if I introduce more symbols, it'll be confusing. Let's take this actual polynomial and suppose it had a solution that looked like this, where you have omega of three over under 24 and omega of A over B. And suppose I arranged it so that the first um, you know, fraction had bigger the denominator than the second fraction. So 124 is bigger than B. If I apply Galois automorphisms, this one solution actually generates a whole bunch of other solutions. You can take this omega of three over 124 and take it to any omega of i over 124 for any i relatively prime to 124. So it turns out that the number of things relatively prime to something is at least the square root of that thing. So this would create at least the square root of 124 points on the surface of height at most 124 if this happened by taking the Galois conjugates. This can't happen with this R being 124 in this case, being larger and larger, or it would directly violate the sub polynomial bound that we have on the number of uh, rational points of height at most R. So for example, there's gonna be asymptotically at most R to the one third points. So if this happened for like 124 and like 100,000 and 100 billion, then that sequence of points would directly violate the, by this construction, it would violate the height bound. So they can only happen finitely many times. So only finitely many solutions in roots of unity. And that's it. That's the, that's the end. It's very sneaky. And that's, the, uh, that's what they used. To, so the Andre Urd conjecture that was recently proved by Zimmerman and Jankar, that's basically just a fancy version of that argument. A Shimura variety has a fancy point called a complex multiplication point, which is the analog of a root of unity. And you just like carry out this argument exactly. And the difficult part of it, so the periodic structure and the definition of a Shimura variety is replaced, with, it is an analog of the fact that you're a torsion point. And the hard part is actually um, uh, getting a good height bound on these complex multiplication points. And that was the thing that was eventually overcome. But uh, yeah, it's just this basic idea and it just works out. Cool. Computers 